also a popular item forever <laughs> these days are frogs. And they come in a variety of uh, assorted uh, shapes, sizes, and styles. And people... That's the voice of Jody Siegel, the manager of Israel's Judaica Center in Thornhill, Ontario. And he was describing to me what items his customers were buying for Passover this year. Aside from the plastic frogs, which some families like mine also put on the Seder tables to engage the kids, acrylic matzo holders and other hostess items and giftware in acrylic are also popular. And if you look at where these Judaica items come from, the labels often say made in China or made in India, like that silver-plated Kiddush cup he had on sale. Thanks to globalization, everything from kipot to menorahs to talitot are now being mass-produced in factories in the Far East and Southeast Asia. They're ordered by wholesale Judaica companies like Right Light and Kazanov, companies which are owned by Jews in the U.S. and Europe and even Israel, and the products then get sold in stores or online at cheaper price points than the bespoke handcrafted Passover giftware that Jewish artists like Carol Boys of South Africa make. Her water jug in stainless steel sells for over $600 at Vancouver's Olive and Wild Shop. So does it matter where your Judaica is made and who's making it? More than ever, I've been thinking about where my dollars get spent. Is the product eco-friendly? Does the company support minority rights or causes that I care about? And does it change the feeling you get if your Seder plate isn't from Israel or even North America, but from China? There is often this very large price gap between the kinds of things that you can get direct from, directly from China and the things that are made that are made elsewhere. Um, it exists in Judaica as well. And I think it ends up having an impact on the way that people experience Judaica as, as a kind of a part of Jewish culture. I'm Ellen Besner, and this is what Jewish Canada sounds like for Wednesday, April the 5th, 2023. Welcome to the CJN Daily, a podcast of the Canadian Jewish News, sponsored by Metropia. Many families will be using cherished heirlooms at their Seder tables. In our family, we use a ceramic wine decanter that's shaped like a fish. There's an afikomen bag made by one of my kids when they were in Hebrew school and a Seder plate we got as a wedding gift. And I just checked, and it says it was made in Israel. But our plastic finger puppets of the plagues and the jumping frogs are definitely made in China. Chinese factories now make talus bags and mezuzahs even, although not the parchment, because that's still supposed to be made by Jews. But do these factories have any understanding of the Judaica they're making, or is it just another product line alongside exercise balls for yoga and running shoes? And how does it all impact Jewish creators? Joining me now is David Svi Kalman. He's a Canadian-born scholar and artist. He works in Philadelphia for the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. And he also has a Judaica business called Printo Craft Press, where he sells unique Haggadot made by Israeli artists, and even one called the Hitler Haggadah, written by a North African Jew about Passover under the Nazis. David Svi Kalman joins me now. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great to meet you. Of course. A couple of years ago, you wrote an article based on your own research about where people, Judaica, on their tables comes from. And many people would be surprised that a lot of it is made in China or in India or other non-Israeli or Canadian <laughs> sites. What first got you interested in finding out about this? It's kind of silly, but I think what triggered it was watching the company Alibaba have its IPO um, and suddenly having access to this amazing world of Chinese manufacturing just on the internet. So I could kind of look up and search anything I wanted around the things that were being made overseas. Um, and so, of course, I looked up all kinds of Judaic items and it turned out that, you know, uh, skull caps and um, you know, uh, menorahs and things like that were all being made in great quantity uh, overseas. So I started being interested, had some conversations with some of the manufacturers to have a sense of this process, um, and just became intrigued with this kind of alternate history of the objects that I had been using for my entire life. I mean, you're an artist, so you obviously are very conscious of looking behind the, the label and seeing where it's from. Wherever you go, it's on your radar, but most people probably wouldn't. Are they even aware of this kind of um, provenance? I think, you know, in the last few years, people have become a lot more aware of how globalization means that many of the things that people buy, uh, many of the ritual objects people buy, many of the 
regular objects people buy are being made overseas and are being made in China uh, and in East Asia in particular. Um, I don't know how much people are particularly aware of how this impacts ritual objects in particular. Um, that being said, I find it interesting because ritual objects are different from other objects in that we have a relationship not just to them, but to the history of those objects, right? The history of the shofar, imagining the way that our parents and our grandparents use these objects, used a menorah, a lot of times they're family heirlooms. So they matter not just in terms of their function, but they matter in terms of where they came from. And so there's one story you can tell about their function um, and about their history that's about, you know, your family's history with those objects. But there's a totally other history you can tell about them, which is about their manufacturing history. Um, and that history, when you tell it from the perspective of, you know, of Chinese manufacturers um, suddenly makes all of the Judaica in your life, or a lot of the Judaica in your life, end up feel, feeling very small because it is just this tiny, tiny piece of this massive industrial machine um, that exists um, in China uh, and in East Asia generally. I mean, I'm feeling icky about it, but is that an issue? Is that a problem? Why does that bother people? that it's not made by Jewish hands. I don't know that it is a problem. I, I think it's fine for Judaica to be made wherever it's made. Since I wrote that article, the truth of the matter is I've started making Judaica and books in China as well. Um, I run a publishing business on the side. We used to do most of our publishing in Michigan. Now we do a lot of our manufacturing, our book publishing in China. Um, a lot of companies have made that shift. Uh, I also sell um, uh, kind of designer dreidels. Those are manufactured in China as well. So I don't think it's a, inherently a problem. I think it's more like, you know, those, if you know those photographs of the Earth taken like from way, way out in space, like beyond Saturn, beyond Jupiter, you know, outside of the solar system, when you turn back and look at Earth and suddenly Earth's this like tiny little dot in the cosmos. I, that's my feeling when I think about Judaica from the perspective of Chinese manufacturers, where it's just like this little nothing. Like if you think about how, um, you know, menorah is like the kind of like the basic menorah that's just like a little piece of metal, like with uh, uh, you know, little uh, clips for individual candles. Those menorahs are made by companies whose main job is to make tin cans. And just like, it's basically a variation on a tin can. There's something that feels, that kind of like makes the whole world of Judaica feel very small and imagining that it's just a variation of this much larger process. Okay, but that's the, speaking about the smaller, the retailers, the mom and pop stores, the small independent ones that, or gift shops in synagogues across North America. When people go to them, People are expecting that it's it's a different experience than if they would realize, oh, I could just order it off the Internet for cheap from China. The whole process of choosing a gift for someone or buying this because it's meaningful. Then when you realize it sort of cheapens it or pops a bubble. So I don't feel like that. I, I don't feel like it inherently cheapens it. What I do see is that. If you think about Judaica in Canada and Judaica in America, there are kind of like these two tracks. Um, there's like supermarket Judaica. You know, you go into a supermarket around Passover and you see like they have, I'm trying to think like what are the, what's the Judaica items you have around Passover? Or like let's say Hanukkah. Hanukkah there's, there's, I mean, no, there's, no, no, do Passover because there's all the puppets, finger puppets right, right, okay. and right, games right. for the table and, and the right, – right. So there's like this kind of like mass produced supermarket Judaica where you have um, these things that are that are kind of direct from a factory in China. Um, and, and that, I think, shapes for a lot of people their impression of the holiday, right? Like for a lot of people, especially people who, you know, don't necessarily have access to the Hebrew or all the commentaries, like a lot of their experience of the Passover Seder and of Passover as a holiday is dictated by the kinds of things that you find in the lo local supermarket. Um, so there's that. And then on the other hand, there is this like, you know, um, galaxy of, uh, of independent creators who are kind of innovating around Judaica items. So one thing that does happen is there is a way in which like that supermarket Judaica makes invisible some of the, the kind of smaller independent creators, which is like a funny conversation I think that has not really been fully explored. Uh, there, there's so much conversation in the Jewish world around like, you know, nonprofits and like, you know, where do you find funding for diff different Jewish nonprofits and like, you know, their growth and their relationship with each other. That's all interesting. There's also kind of like a separate conversation around Jewish for-profit organizations um, and the way that um, the Chinese manufacturing and its use has an impact on ma the magnification of certain kinds of Judaica, certain kind of like iconic kinds of Judaica against like the wide variety. Um, and what it results in is often the people having a sense of Jewish ritual objects as being a kind of, um, you know, one size fits all, like it's all just vanilla, um, as opposed to actually something where there's a lot of innovation, and a lot of variation, because of the way that there is a kind of default is created uh, through, um, you know, through companies that are partnered with Chinese manufacturers. What that means, if I understand, is that there's less chance for an individual like yourself who makes 
let's say, bespoke or boutique art to find a market in a mass situation? I'd say less for me because I, I do work with a lot of manufacturers, but for artists who are making like, who are literally hand making their items, um, making them in small quantities, uh, there is then this huge gap between that kind of work and the kind of mass produced, um, mass produced material. So, you know, look, that is true for, you know, in every industry, right. You can talk about, you know, like shirts, right. Like, you know, you talk about like mass produced shirts versus, you know, designer shirts. Okay. So that's where I'm interested in the experience. You, you raised it earlier, which is that you have your family story and then there's an origin story of, you know, where this object comes from, which is kind of like a good story is always important. And if it's, oh, I, I bought this for you for your wedding to have a beautiful home and invite me to Seder's. And then you find out it's just like some melamine from China. Does that take away from the enjoyment and the significance of this ritual object? You know, um, I remember a few years ago, um, I was buying, I was in Istanbul and I was buying a rug. Uh, as one does in Istanbul. And, you know, some of the rugs that are made in Istanbul are made by human beings, and some of them are made by machines. And for a person who is untrained, you kind of can't tell the difference. And for a while after we brought the rug home, I was like thinking, like, I was trying to figure out, is there a way for me to tell this? Is this actually made by, a, you know, my, made by a machine, made by a person? Can I tell? Um, does this impact the way I think about the price that I paid for it? And after a while, I was just like, you know what? I like the rug. <laughs> like who cares at the end of the day uh so look there, there is a kind of like intellectual way in which having judaica that is made in china uh can make people feel differently about it i think it's especially um interesting when people think not just about the particular object that they own but about like the world of objects that are being made um at the end of the day if people don't like judaica if people like a particular object like who's to say that the country of origin should have anything to and should have anything to do with the way that they feel about it and anything to do with their, uh, their enjoyment from it. Okay. And then speaking about the price differentials, and we're now in a situation, especially in Canada, where the economy and inflation is impacting people's budgets at home. They are going to food, but I mean, it's tough, tough times out there. And so, you know, what are you seeing in terms of uh, the demand this season for Judaica that maybe even in your own business? Mm. Look, I can tell you that, you know, for uh, uh, one of the things I sell is Hagadot. Um, and, you know, I've had to raise my prices a little bit for Hagadot, actually, not because of, of manufacturing, because of shipping costs. The shipping costs have, have gone up significantly. Um, so, yeah, I think everyone's feeling it. And it's tough because, like, I, I, there, there are some industries where, you know, you're just trying to get, like, as much money as you possibly can. I try to think that uh, I sell Judaica at a price point that makes it accessible for people. Like it actually matters that people are, are able to purchase it at a reasonable price, but it's been harder this year than it has been in previous years. Is there anything intrinsically against halacha or the Jewish law where these things should be made by and handled by Jewish people? So that's really interesting. So, so most Judaica has been outsourced, but there's a few important exceptions. One exception is tzitzit, uh, kind of like ritual fringes, in part out of a sense that the fringes themselves are supposed to be tied by Jews. And so, whereas the rest of, you know, it, it's possible that the garments themselves, not the fringes, but the garments themselves are still manufactured in China or in India or places like that, those in unfinished products are then shipped to places like Israel for the final step uh, for those ritual purposes. Uh, you also have like uh, people who make skull caps, uh, custom skull caps. Those things also still happen um, in Canada and the U.S. in part because it's just um, it's not efficient to kind of like, you know, print 300 kippas for so and so's bar mitzvah in China and then ship it over. So those things are are also made in the U.S. Um, but but there's really just those small exceptions. Think about the the scale of manufacturing. Canada has a 400,000 Jews, the third largest diaspora Jewish community outside of Israel and is growing. I wonder whether it's even on a scale that it still would be impossible to bring the manufacturing home as North America is trying to do now after the pandemic with this stuff. Is it even realistic or, or we're, we're, the, that ship has sailed? Uh, I, I don't see it happening anytime soon. It's just too easy. It's just too easy. And look, th there have been some benefits to it. Like, for example, I don't know if you know about things like um, like the kosher switch. Uh, or like kosher lamps that are you know, like these kind of electronics that are designed to um, get around certain uh, regulations in uh, law, the laws of Shabbat. 
Um, so there has been an incredible explosion in innovation in the last 10 years in those kind of objects, in part because it is pretty easy to tell a Chinese manufacturer, like, here's my specifications, make the light like this. And so I, I don't know that we would have those kind of objects if it wasn't for the outsourcing of Judaica. It, it really is uh, being able to quickly tap into that um, that manufacturing center. So there are definitely benefits there. And, and I think the kosher lamp is made by a, a Canadian company, if I'm if I'm correct, or at least the original kosher lamp is made by a Canadian company. Well, that's a point that I do want to raise is that I've heard from artists and from some local retailers that even if an artist makes something unique and wants to sell it, it's quickly copied by some smart entrepreneur and made for like half the price in China. Is that something that you resonate with that resonates when you've heard about this? It's something that I worry about. I mean, look, uh, it's it's the reason that when I came out with my 20 sided dreidel, it was important to me to patent it immediately. Um, and it's the reason that it's actually ended up delaying delaying a couple of, of new products that I'm trying to sell in part because I'm actually concerned about the intellectual property uh, connected to them. So yeah, that does that has had an impact. So that's advice is patent everything if you don't want to copy. And you can try, you can try, but it's hard. I mean, some of it, you kind of have to accept that some of the objects are going to be inevitably copied. It is hard to get around that. So this th- this year, you were mentioning uh, before we started taping that AI Haggadahs are making a thing, are making a, their entree into the Seder tables of the, of North America. Is that uh, you want to you want to just tell us what that's all about? Because I'm sure people have done AI or for their own, you know, just for fun to see what it would come back with. But yeah, I mean, so look, Jewish artists are like all other artists uh, often look for the newest, most cutting edge tools to, um, to create whatever, whatever it is that they want to make. Um, this year, the newest tools are AI tools. And so almost inevitably there are, um, Huggadot coming out this year that are created in part or in whole, uh, with the help of artificial intelligence tools. Um, by itself, I think that's fine. I think like it's, it's, People can use whatever tools they want to make whatever art they want to make. That's that's good and healthy. Um, I am a little bit concerned about selling those Haggadot explicitly as um, art and commentary that is not generated by human beings, uh, meaning selling it and kind of like washing your hands of your own role in the art, I think, is is a little bit dangerous because it can lead to a situation where you end up cheapening the efforts um, of Haggadot um, of all kinds, right? You take something that had previously been treated as sacred and you kind of commodify it by saying, you know, if you, you, you know, you spend six months making this Haggadah, you may, you may, you spend three years making this Haggadah, I can make 20 Haggadot in 20 minutes. Um, so I think there is something concerning about that. It's fine to use the tools themselves, but, um, I worry about people coming to accept the use of these technologies kind of automatically uh, reflexively in places where they should actually be demanding more um, more of a human touch. An AI one is easy and cheap, and we are in 2023, and everyone sort of accepts it already, but maybe we need to evolve too. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I, I do want to be careful. I, I don't want to draw the, the link too closely, in part because it's not like by some cheap menorah isn't made by anybody. It is made by somebody. There is a story behind it. It might be a story that's unfamiliar to me, a story that's different from my own personal culture, but it is still a story as opposed to the the output of an AI system where it's a kind of just probabilistic mess, but doesn't really have any kind of meaning beyond that. Thank you so much for being on this, CJ and Thank Daily, you. for sharing all this with us. Good luck. Thanks. Bye. One other thing to think about Human rights organizations say that some factories in China have used forced labor, specifically ethnic Muslim Uyghurs who were sent in from re-education camps. But I don't know whether any Judaica products were being made in factories which benefited from the Chinese government's human rights abuses of their Uyghur minority. And that's what Jewish Canada sounds like for this episode of the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. Integrity, community, quality and customer care. Today's listener shout-out goes to Gita gutman Berman in Atlanta, Georgia. She's putting a little maple syrup into the haroset this year to give her family a taste of her native land. And we'll end the episode with a note about our publishing schedule. There's no show Thursday this week due to the Passover holiday. On Monday, subscribers to the podcast will hear the great Canadian Seder episode from my colleagues at Bonjour Chai. And we're back on Tuesday, April the 11th. On behalf of all of us here at the CJN Daily, thanks for listening and have a very happy holiday.